Hello, and welcome to IP by Design. Thank you for joining Fish & Richardson today for a discussion on protecting unique products using trade dress, patent, and copyright. My name is Lisa greenwald Swire. I'm a principal in Fish's Silicon Valley office and have the honor of being today's moderator. I'm joined by my colleagues, Jim Babineau in the Austin office, Kristen McKillian in New York, Mark Puzella in Boston, and Jan Zucker in Munich. To learn more about us, please feel free to read through our biographies on the side of your screen. Today's webinar will run for 75 minutes and includes a question and answer period at the end of the program. You may ask questions at any time throughout the webinar by clicking the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen to submit your question. We'll try our best to answer them all at the end of the presentation, time permitting. Please also feel free to contact us individually after the webinar if that's easier for you. As you can see, you can contact uh, Makrovic at fr.com for any CLE credits or questions about CLE. Before we get started, I should remind you that the content of this presentation is for educational purposes only and does not necessarily reflect the opinions of Fish and Richardson. It's also not intended to address every situation. Our next webinar will be on August 6th and will focus on advertising and social media issues. Intellectual property rights holders often have to creatively protect their product designs. Their desire and need for immediate protection must be balanced with the type, length, and strategic advantages of protection available. There are strategic advantages to protection by design patents, which protect the way an article looks, trade dress, which protects the appearance of a package or product and is like a trademark for design, and copyright, which protects original works of authorship. Our panel today will review what each form of protection covers and we will then review the issues presented with a fictional client, Perfect Watches, and its Meow Time Watch and accompanying app. With that, I will turn to Jim Babineau to discuss design protection. Okay, well, thank you, Lisa. When we talk about design protection, um, we are often talking about uh, what we call design patents in most countries. And uh, in uh, some regions, there are designs which are registered. It's very similar to design patents, and, and Jan Zeke will also talk about doing that in the EU. One of the big things that uh, sources of confusion that we have when we talk about design patents is that while many people are familiar with patents, uh, what they usually think of when they think of a patent is a ut what we call a utility patent. It would have a number of technical drawings, sometimes schematics and flowcharts, several columns of descriptive text describing embodiments, and at the end, numbered paragraphs of claims. Now, as Lisa mentioned, um, design patent protects the way an article looks. A utility patent protects the way, essentially, the way an article works. A utility patent protects the function. It's an idea that's articulable in words, and the claims at the end articulate what the idea is that's being protected. Uh, utility patents are given a term, a maximum term of 20 years from the date of the first filed application, and you do pay maintenance fees in the U.S., annuities in other countries, uh, to keep the protection alive until the end of the term. A design patent, um, compared to utility patent, first of all, they're usually quicker to obtain. They're usually less expensive. Uh, they have a term that is uh, now 15 years from when it grants, uh, as opposed to the 20 from filing for utility patents. There are no maintenance fees in the U.S. Um, the thing about design patents, however, and this is where some of the confusion runs, I will tell you this, maybe five, six years ago, there were a number of clients who really didn't bother to file design patents. They were seen, um, even by many practitioners, as being relatively narrow, easy to get around, of not much value. And frankly, some of the people that filed design patents filed them when they thought, I really don't have an idea that's protectable by utility patent, but I'd really like to say patent pending on my product for the first year. And so they would file a design patent. The, the uh, indus various industries are seeing that, that design patents really do have some, uh, more value than that and can be written in a much broader way. Uh, types of things that can be protected by design patent. Well, first of all, we have the overall appearance of a product. 
Uh, we have specific ornamentation or portions of a product that can be separately protected by design patent. But even packaging and, and patterns, like patterns on uh, a new fabric uh, pattern, for example, can be protected by design patent. And in the computer science and electrical arts, uh, people are uh, more frequently filing design patents now to protect things like uh, user interfaces, fonts, icons, even animations, and we'll get into that a little bit later in the talk today. So I mentioned that years ago people thought of design patents as being fairly narrow. Uh, I will say that the scope of a design patent is primarily determined by the drawings themselves. If you looked at a design patent, which in the U.S. is a patent whose number begins with the letter D and followed by six digits, uh, you'll see mostly drawings. There's very little text in a design patent. Um, the scope of the patent, therefore, is determined by the drawings. At the end of the patent, it would say, I claim the design of this thing substantially is shown and described. If you want to, if you illustrate a um, design patent a product, a, pat a product in a design patent, all by solid black and white lines, which is how we do it uh, normally, uh, then the scope of the of the patent will really be limited to what is essentially looks for all intents and purposes exactly like what you show in the drawings. However, what you can do in a design patent to increase the scope is to change the way, is either to change the way the drawings are lined, for example, uh, you can show non-essential features uh, only in dashed lines, that's, that's how to disclaim certain portions or surfaces or features of the product. But you can also include multiple embodiments, and we have some figures here that just illustrate this for example, if you came up with a new handle for a, for a, a, a mug or a cup uh, and, you had, and you came up essentially with uh, versions of that handle that operated in different, for different types of products, you could uh, include multiple versions as shown in here and uh, ostensibly get protection for that design as applied to any number of, of, uh, of types of, of vessels. Um, now, uh, moving on then, uh, I guess I will mention briefly that uh, uh, what many practitioners don't realize is that you can really include a lot of words in a design patent, and sometimes those words can help to broaden the scope of protection. Uh, so that should be thought of as well. Uh, Jan, do you want to speak for a minute about uh, uh, protection in the EU? Thank you, Jim. Sure. There are a lot of differences between uh, design protection in Europe and in the US. Uh, as far as uh, conceptual differences go, uh, in the EU you get protection for a specific design. In the US uh, it's more about protection for the idea behind the design. That's also the reason why in the US you can file for different embodiments of the same design idea and the same application as Jim just showed it to you on his last slide. This is something that's not possible in the EU. In the US, it's also possible to amend drawings uh, after filing, uh, something that's typically not possible in the EU either. What is possible in the EU, though, is uh, to file so-called multiple applications, several applications for a whole series of designs which benefit from considerable fee discounts. As far as procedural differences go, uh, there is substantive examination in the US. For example, uh, the USPTO does an official search for prior designs. In the EU, this does not exist. The office only reviews the consistency of the drawings, some formalities and fees. And that's also one of the reasons why you typically get a design registration in the EU much quicker than uh, a design patent in the US. Talking about design protection uh, in the EU, uh, if you want a US design patent, you of course go to the USPTO. If you want a design registration uh, in the European Union, uh, a design registration being the equivalent to a US design patent, you have the choice. You can go to the Office for Harmonization in the Internal Market, or OHIM, the European Communities Trademark and Design Office, 
and obtain a registered community design. This is a uniform registration which covers all 28 EU member states. Community designs are registered very fast, within days. They are rather inexpensive. You can get them for from $1,500 total costs. And they are very efficient because uh, they can be renewed for up to 25 years and to some extent allow, allow EU-wide litigation. What you can also do, you can also go to the National Patent and Trademark Offices and obtain a national design registration. National design registrations only cover a single EU member state, uh, are typically uh, less fast, less efficient, uh, and more costly if you file in all 28 member states. And this not only at the filing stage, but also when it comes to renewals. A third option uh, which you have uh, in the EU, that's something that's coming soon for US applicants, you can also go or you will also be able to go to the World Intellectual, Intellectual Property Office or WIPO, the International Trademark and Design Office and obtain an international design registration designating either the European Union uh, as such or selected EU member states. Jim, will you take it from here? Certainly. <clears throat> well, on this slide, we're going to be talking a little bit about enforcement of design patents, and we bring this up primarily so that you can see uh, where some of these types of protection uh, start to, to differ. Um, now, first of all, in the U.S., let's talk about in the U.S. first, how we enforce design patents. You'll find that if you get involved in much, uh, patent litigation, most of the design patent infringement cases are seeking an injunction or telling the infringing party to stop. There's no, no one is interested in giving a license. Frequently, these design patent uh, trials are between competitors, uh, frankly. Uh, but they do settle quickly, uh, and there are some reasons for that. There are <clears throat> two requirements that the court has to find for infringement, and these illustrate a little bit how the, some of these other types of IP protection, like trademark and copyright, influence design patent uh, litigation specifically. Uh, well, first of all, the court has to find that the designs, in order for there to be infringement, that the accused design has to be substantially the same as the design that's protected in the design patent, um, but specifically enough that it would de deceive an ordinary observer into purchasing one of them, supposing it to be the other. And that sounds an awful lot like trademark trade dress, right? Um, but beyond that, the court also has to find that the accused design must essentially appropriate the novelty that distinguishes it from the prior art. In other words, if there was a design that was very similar to the protected design that existed before it, whatever the difference is between the protected design and that earlier design has to be found in the accused device. Another aspect of design patents that's specific to design patents and not with utility patents is that the law says that if infringement is found, the court must award damages that are no less than the infringer's gross profit from having practiced the invention, having sold uh, products of, a, of, of the protected design. And so you can see already this is a much bigger hammer in litigation than a reasonable royalty or um, other types of typical damages calculations. This, because there's, there's uh, statutory damages, sounds a little bit more like copyright protection. Um, now, like utility patent cases, they're tried to a jury in the U.S. Um, however, we find that in, in litigating design patents, there's often more of an opportunity to get before the jury as the patent owner evidence of activity which, which goes to sort of the kindergarten level of what's good and bad, um, and that can be very powerful before a U.S. jury. Uh, so again, with design patents, it's like utility patents, but with a flavor of trademark and copyright thrown in. One important thing, though, to find infringement of a design patent, you never have to show that the, that the accused infringer copied anything. They don't have had to have had access to your product or anything. They just have to have produced a design that is substantially the same as what you showed in your design patent. Uh, Jan, you want to talk about the US, EU for a moment? Sure. In the EU, design registrations uh, can be enforced by the courts or by the customs. 
if you go to court, you can bring all kinds of claims. You can bring cease and desist claims, damage claims, destruction claims, recall claims, and cost claims. If you uh, send in the customs, uh, this allows seizing and destroying goods very efficiently at very low costs, but only if no one objects to that. If someone objects, you will end up in court and have to sort out the case with the judge. The validity of design registrations is presumed in the EU, but it can be challenged in court. What makes sense for an unexamined right, uh, as you will recall, no substantive examination. So there has to be a place somewhere for the defendant to uh, question the validity of uh, a design registration used against him. The burden of proof here, uh, though, is on the infringer, uh, which might fight an upward battle uh, uh, frequently. Uh, the two questions which uh, come up when the validity is tested are whether the design covered by the registration uh, was new uh, and did have an individual character at the time of filing. The scope of design registrations under EU law extends to all products having the same overall impression. The test, to some extent, is similar to what uh, is uh, typically uh, seen in the US, but also has its differences. Perhaps some words also about damages. Damages are not fully harmonized uh, in the EU uh, and still, to some extent, depend on national law in the 28 EU member states. Typically, what you can recover are profits lost, profits made, or a reasonable license fee. What typically is not available are punitive damages. Jim? Okay. We wanted to, um, oops. We wanted to go uh, talk a little bit about some recent developments in design patent law. And in the U.S., there's really just a couple of things to mention. As, I, as we said earlier, People in the uh, electronic arts are doing more and more design patenting. Uh, there's been some very significant uh, battles um, between uh, large U.S. companies, for example, or large companies in this space. So there's been in the news the, the big battles between Samsung and Apple, for example, enforcing design patents. And because of all this, people have, uh, are increasingly aware of the value of design patents in protecting their IP. Uh, the U.S. Patent Office, on the other hand, is taking a much more tough approach on, uh, on patent applicants. Uh, it, was five, it was true five, ten years ago that uh, your patent applicant was at liberty to change the type of line showing any particular feature in a design patent application within reason uh, after filing, which, as we mentioned, changes the scope of the claim substantially. Um, now, the, the Patent Office is much tougher on when amendments can be made and how to be make them. Uh, also, and I think we had a question about this from, from one, of the uh, one of the attendees of this um, webinar. Uh, the U.S. is a recent signatory to the uh, Hague Convention. Uh, technically went into effect last December, but um, the USPTO is still promulgating rules, et cetera. It would probably be the end of, towards the end of this year when it will actually go into effect. But what this will give to U.S. applicants is something similar to the PCT, if you're familiar uh, with that treaty for utility applications or the Madrid Protocol for trademarks, that you can file a single patent application that can have a lot of the formalities dealt with at an international level um, and can be applicable then for many uh, member states. Uh, without having to uh, have translations and, uh, and those sorts of things. So there can be some significant benefits, um, uh, but it also, as compared to U.S. design applications, has some, um, has some limitations. And we can, it's probably too much for this talk today to get into some of the details, but bottom line is um, uh, towards the end of this year, you should see the U.S. Uh, becoming a full member to that uh, convention and it's fully expected that uh, Korea will be joining this year, and after the U.S. joins, Canada, Japan, and some other major countries will join. I think it's up to 62 countries at this point. It'll become a very important uh, tool for applicants. Jan? I'd like to highlight uh, two recent trends uh, from the EU, one at the prosecution side, one at the litigation side. At the prosecution side, uh, I'm seeing more and more minefield applications. When I say minefield applications, uh, I mean applications for a whole series of designs 
which are all more or less close to um, a given product of interest. Uh, they are intended to make the life for me too products more difficult uh, because uh, if you uh, adopt a similar design uh, with a me too product, you will move into this minefield of uh, design registrations. This is possible as contrary to trademark registrations, there is no use requirement for design registrations in the EU. Uh, we are still waiting to see some more case law uh, regarding the question when this might be abusive. At the litigation side, uh, we see more EU-wide litigation, and that's only natural now that uh, a lot of uh, uh, community design registrations have been granted. Uh, the owners, of course, want to test out uh, the possibility of uh, bringing EU-wide court actions, one of the uh, benefits. The two challenges you typically face are first to find a court which has jurisdiction, ideally EU-wide, what, what can be um, a challenge, and then second to bring claims under the various uh, national laws because, as I mentioned before, a law only has been harmonized in part in the EU. If you bring an EU-wide damage claim, uh, you may end up having to explain to the court uh, how damage claims are granted under French law, under German law, under UK law, and so on. I will leave it at that. Mark, you have the floor. Thank you, Jan. So I'm going to talk uh, for a few moments about trade dress, which generally speaking concerns the outward appearance of a, a package or a product. And as we'll see in a few minutes when we get into the hypothetical, um, we're, we're going to talk about the outward design of a watch and an app that goes along with a watch. Um, so we'll, we'll apply these trade dress and um, the design patent concepts to those in a minute. So trade dress may generally be thought of as a trademark, but for designs. So the, the doctrine protects the source identifying quality of the design. So like with the trademark, it protects you from consumer confusion, uh, mistakes of sponsorship or affiliation, uh, and if the dress is sufficiently famous, it can also protect you from dilution. So if you, um, you I'm sure many of you know the, uh, the Coca-Cola bottle, it's a famous trade dress, that is something that could be protected from dilution um, separately from just the likelihood of confusion. So there are generally um, two types of, of dress. There's, there's the packaging and the labeling and then the product design itself, and they have somewhat different um, uh, protection requirements in that product packaging and labeling. It's possible for it to be inherently um, protected if it's sufficiently unique. Um, what that may be is really um, uh, difficult to say. Um, because courts really do nothing more than a sniff test as to whether a product design, uh, rather product packaging is, is unique such that you don't require additional proof that it's distinctive. Now with product design, so the overall configuration of the product, uh, it cannot be inherently distinctive, so you have to have what's called secondary meaning. Now secondary meaning, it's the same as in um, a regular trademark. Um, the evidence of secondary meaning can be things like um, advertising spend, sales over time, consumer surveys, third-party recognition of the design, just evidence that supports a finding that consumers uh, understand the purpose of the design to be source identifying rather than just attractive. So if you have secondary meaning, you're very likely to be protected um, with a couple additional rules. So trade dress can't be functional. Um, trademarks are very, very much the same way. So uh, what you're claiming is your trade dress can't be essential to the, the use of the article. Um, there are um, issues concerning um, something called aesthetic functionality, which is particularly difficult in that courts are split as to one, whether they recognize 
the doctrine of aesthetic functionality, but two, as to um, what would constitute aesthetic functionality. And the thinking is generally that if the aesthetic of the dress is central to its selling proposition, then it's functional in that respect. And because it's functional, it can't be source identifying. So as we'll get into uh, a little bit later, you want to manage um, through your marketing and your, you know, your, your packaging and everything that goes along with it, um, how it is that you characterize the dress and uh, present it to the public, because that's going to drive in many ways um, how the court's going to perceive the, the purpose of the aesthetic and whether it's functional or source identifying. Um, trade dress can be registered like a trademark. Uh, there's some expense involved. It's, it's not particularly ins expensive. It involves a, a search and registration fees. Uh, you get the benefit of pre prima facie ownership and national constructive use. Um, those are helpful things to have in an infringement scenario. Uh, and you, you also, uh, you make your enforcement efforts easier for, on a very practical level in that you, you demonstrate that trade dress um, is more than an afterthought. It's something that is central to your IP strategy. And that's important at a, at a practical level for many courts because um, a lot of plaintiffs in the trade dress space um, assert their trade dress without having spent the time in advance of intending to protect the trade dress. So it, it often seems when you read cases that the courts are skeptical about whether the plaintiff um, prior to the infringement ever really thought about the fact that they had trade dress or not. Um, so a, a registration is a very uh, straightforward and relatively low, uh, low cost way to demonstrate that no, this is, this is a, a central piece of uh, the overall IP scheme. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, the copyright section with Krista McCallion. Thanks, Mark. Hello, everybody. Um, last but certainly not least, we're going to talk a little bit about copyright law. Copyright law, as many of you probably know, protects original works of authorship. I believe that Lisa mentioned that earlier in her intro today. Examples of copyrightable works include books, and other written material like brochures, advertisements, website content, user manuals for products, artwork as well is of course protected by copyright. And when I say artwork, that includes things like drawings, designs, logos, not all the time, but only sometimes, um, fabric patterns as well, photographs, music, architectural drawings, and architectural works the wide spectrum of different types of works that are protected by copyright. Uh, but there's also a wide spectrum of things that are not protected by copyright, including facts and ideas and concepts. Those are not protectable by copyright. Single words and short phrases, also not protectable. Um, and just like trade dress, and this is a running theme throughout, functional material is also not protected by copyright. Sometimes functional products do embody non-functional non -functional elements, and when those non-functional elements can be separated out, so to speak, from the functional material, either conceptually or physically, they may be afforded copyright protection. Um, separability tests like the ones I just mentioned have been applied to belt buckles, furniture, lamps, and other functional goods that very often have non-functional um, or creative artistic elements attached to them. Um, clothing designs are also typical, typically considered functional and not protected by copyright. However, the fabric patterns that you see on clothing designs are normally protected by copyright. And computer programs are very often protected by copyright. Um, we will discuss those in greater detail in a little bit as we move forward in our hypo. Always an important consideration when we're talking about copyrights is ownership. Many people assume that if they've hired someone to create copyrightable material for them, well then they just own it. 
It's not always that simple. Um, it is true sometimes, but it's just not always the case. So for example, when the hiring party is an employer and a copyrightable work is prepared by an employee of the company within the scope of the employee's job, the employer and not the employee is considered to be the author and, and the owner of the copyright. This is a little bit of an exception um, because generally the author is always deemed to be the owner of the copyright. So when the author is an employee of the company, that company turns out to be the owner of the copyright. And that is what we call a work made for hire. Um, but there is another hypothetical, um, which is in the case of when your company or your employer hires independent contractors. And this happens quite frequently. Um, for example, computer programmers who are not employees uh, photographers, videographers, website content creators, even advertising agencies, all of these types of individuals and companies are very likely hired all the time um, by your company. And so these are not employees. They're deemed independent contractors. And whatever these independent contractors create is not automatically owned by the hiring party um, because these independent contractors are not employees. So the difference between an employee and an independent contractor in the world of copyrights is very important and it has significant impact on ownership. Um, in the case of when a company does hire an independent contractor, in order for the company to ensure its ownership of any copyrightable material that's created, it has got to get a written agreement signed by the individual person or company hired. So if you are hiring an independent contractor and you want to make sure that you own the content that they've created for you, you would want to have an assignment agreement signed by them, um, which would apply in many, many cases. And in some circumstances, um, a work for hire agreement may apply. But work for hire agreements with independent contractors may not apply all the time. Um, they apply only in certain situations with certain types of works that are enumerated in the Copyright Act. Another great feature of copyright is that it enjoys a rather long term of protection. It lasts for the author's life plus an additional 70 years. And in the case of a work for hire, which I was just talking about, the work is protected from 95 years from first publication or 120 years from creation, whichever is shorter. So it has a long shelf life, so to speak. And registration in the copyright context is also very important. While copyright protection attaches automatically to a work once it is fixed, a registration is actually required to sue for copyright infringement in federal court. Also, if you obtain a copyright registration in a timely manner, you are awarded certain benefits. Um, you can claim statutory damages, which amount to up to $150,000 for willful infringement. And if you are the copyright owner who prevails in a copyright infringement case, you may be entitled to get your attorney's fees back, attorney's fees and costs. Um, so that is definitely a great benefit and um, forces some people, so to speak, to get registrations early on, um, very soon after their work is released to the public, and sometimes even before that preliminary public release. So with that, I am going to turn our talk back over to Lisa. Thanks, Kristen. Um, we'll now walk through a fictional scenario with Perfect Watches, LLC. Uh, so as you've seen, there are three forms of intellectual property that most clients can and should consider filing in parallel to have the strongest intellectual property rights. That's design protection, copyright, and trade dress. Used together, these forms of intellectual property provide comprehensive protection to a single product. Today, we'll be talking to our fictional client, Perfect Watches, LLC, which came to FISH seeking IP counseling on the best ways to protect its brand new line of watches called Meow Time. 
Perfect Watches does not want to sell any old watch, of course. It wants to introduce to the market a brand new type of watch that has immediate appeal to consumers. The Meow Time watch will be marketed to preteens and teenagers, and Perfect Watches wants its Meow Time watch to be the next best thing. It also wants to consider protecting a corresponding app. So with that, Kristen, can you share with us your initial review of any copyrightable material? Of course. Thank you, Lisa. Well, as everyone can see on the slide, Perfect Watches came to us with some very preliminary plans, um, but they had some very big and amazing ideas. They were eager to hit the market with the next big thing, but they had a ways to go in terms of design and development. So what you see here on their slide is a very preliminary outline of really just the general size and shape of the watch the client wanted its Meow Time watch to embody. At the most basic level, Perfect Watches knew that its watch would not be oversized or too bulky on someone's wrist. It also wanted the face of its watch to, to at least appear a little bit in a classic way. Um, and it also knew that its watch would have a slim fabric band, no metal band, and that was for the purpose um, of displaying a creative artwork, a pattern or print, um, which would be displayed around the entire band of the watch, so that when someone was watch wearing the watch, the artwork on the band would be displayed around the entire wrist. As it turned out, Perfect Watches had just hired an artist um, as a new employee of the company, and because of this, um, we here at FISH advised Perfect Watches that whatever that artist created for the company in the scope of her employment would automatically be owned by the company as a work made for hire, as we were talking about earlier. In a work made for hire situation like this one, where the employee is hired to create copyrightable material for the company, like I said earlier, it's the company and not the employee that is deemed the author and the copyright owner. So that's great, and Perfect Watches was definitely off to a wonderful start. Um, it understood that its very preliminary ideas for the size and shape of the watch did not really merit IP protection just yet, but it advised me that its artist was working on some initial artwork for the band of its watch that Perfect Watches was very excited about. And you should see it right there on the slide. Um, a colorful striped pattern with a cat paw overlay. Perfect Watches had created some fabric swatches with this artwork. Um, and this is the artwork that it was very excited about. Its artist had just created it, and it was going to go on the entire band of the watch, which you can see up on your slide. When we were talking with Perfect Watches about this artwork, we advise them that it certainly looks copyrightable, and we also advise them to file an application to register the design that you see as two-dimensional artwork. In addition to this artwork for the band of the watch, Perfect Watches also tells us that they have come up with a very unique design concept that will really make this watch a hit. They are going to have a cat face watch face that will depict the eyes, nose, and mouth of a cat inside the face of the watch. And it will also have cat ears affixed to the sides of the watch. I'm going to turn it over to Jim to discuss that. Thank you. Um, what we sh you see on the screen now are the types of drawings that someone might prepare to file in a design patent uh, application for the overall watch appearance. And, you can see it's, it has, we have seven views here. We have six orthogonal views, in other words, a uh, front, back, left, right, uh, top and bottom view of the watch assembly. And if you can see in the front view, you can see these little ears that poke up above the uh, watch face. And there's a, uh, it's hard to see there, but there's a little cat face in the, in the middle of the, of the face of the watch. Uh, so this is what someone could file very inexpensively as a design patent application in the U.S. and put patent pending on the product as they ship it out the door. Um, and chances are a design patent application filed like this would be issued uh, within six to eight months uh, at very low cost. But it would cover essentially the design as it's shown completely with all of those features uh, that are illustrated. And what I want to do in one other slide is simply talk about how 
uh, such as a design patent application could be filed to really focus on the features that the, um, that this watch company thinks are the unique attributes of their of the look and the overall feel of their of their watch. In this case, uh, here are some drawings that could be filed to to protect specifically the look of the face and the ears. You can see that many of the other all the other features that are shown in these drawings are shown in dashed outline only. That only represents uh, environment of the design, and people could uh, change all the aspects of what's shown in dashed outlines in their product and still be found to infringe. Uh, what's what's shown in solid line only, uh, only in solid line, is the uh, are the ears with the surface shading on the ears, uh, the uh, the outline of the of the face, um, and the facial features, the hands, the numbers, etc. Uh, pattern on the on the watch band are all shown in in dashed outline. So uh, again, this is just pointing out one example of, of, of a design application that can be filed. It's frequent when someone comes out with a new design of a product that uh, has multiple portions that are protectable to file multiple design applications in parallel. For example, when major companies release a new toothbrush design and they've spent a lot of time working on the handle and the head and the bristles and all these things, it's been known to file six or seven patent applications simultaneously focusing on different parts of the overall design. So with that, um, Mark, do you want to talk about uh, trade dress aspects of this product? Sure. So uh, in this next slide, we have uh, a few things we're going to talk about in connection with trying to protect the trade dress. So we have the completed watches on the right, and what's interesting is um, there are a variety of different colors, and we, we'll, we'll talk about um, whether the colors themselves are, are protectable in a minute. But um, let's just uh, imagine a design that, that is of no particular color, um, but it's the same watch, um, that being the trade dress, the, the entire appearance of the watch being the, the artwork on the band, the shape of the face with the ears, and the um, design of the face on the watch face itself with the eyes, the nose, and the mouth. So that would be what we'd... Um, call the dress. So uh, what's interesting about trade dress is it's source identifying. So in order to uh, protect it, uh, you should take affirmative steps to try and make an association in the consumer's mind between the design, those elements you want to protect, and you as manufacturer's source. So there are things you can do to do that, that are actually very persuasive to courts. And one of those things is what's called look for advertising. And look for advertising is um, things like the, the small advertisement in the middle here, which is Meow Time by Perfect Watches, quote, the cat face watch face. So you're communicating to the public that um, the design is intended to communicate that it's a Meow Time watch, not just that it is a watch that looks like a cat. Um, so uh, you can further the, the enforceability of your trade dress by doing simple things like marketing it in a way that emphasizes this consumer connection. Um, now, this is a bit of a um, hit you over the head example of look for advertising. You could be more a little more subtle, um, but you just don't want to be too subtle um, because then, you know, the, the court or the jury might miss it. Um, so to some degree in creating uh, this association, uh, you, you have the ability to drive the association through marketing um, that's separate from just the, the watch design itself. Now, we, we mentioned earlier that in product design, uh, you need secondary meaning. And you know, a look for advertising is something that would be um, not evidence of secondary meaning, but it would allow you to be fairly confident that if you surveyed uh, consumers, that they would identify the design with you as a source. Another thing is this small um, news article here, Meow Time sells a million watches. Um, evidence of sales of the watch is supportive of a finding of secondary meaning. Um, 
evidence of uh, um, marketing spend of you know a certain amount over a certain period of years is also supportive of a finding of secondary meaning. So um, there are different ways that you can support your claim trade dress. Um, and I, I mentioned at the outset that one of the interesting things here is the, the different colors. Um, that's a good example of uh, where the line is between uh, protectable dress and non-protectable design. Um, you might claim in an infringement that you have rights in the overall design, but not necessarily rights in the overall design in pink because uh, consumers don't necessarily associate pink with the manufacturer's source any more so than they would associate the green or the blue. Um, so uh, you, you have to be very particular about what it is that you consider your dress and how it is that you go about marketing it. Um, so that's that's an interesting piece about trade dress and now we're going to uh, of the watch itself and now we're going to move along into an app that the company has created to go along with the watch. You know these are targeted at uh, preteens and teens so of course every product needs an app to go along with it. Um, here we have the icon that you would see on your your phone or your tablet. This is something that could also be um, registered as a trademark, uh, not necessarily trade dress, although if it also appeared on product packaging, uh, it could be considered trade dress. So this could be uh, separately registered as a trademark. Um, and then I think we're going to next talk about uh, whether this also could be copyrighted. Thanks, Mark. So here we have some um, additional visuals. Again, there is the app icon that Mark was just speaking about. Um, and let me just interject for those that are New Yorkers on the line in need of CLE credit. You see up on this slide the New York CLE code number 604. Um, that I believe is the code you need to give your report to your CLE, <laughs> whatever it is that you have to do. But there it is up on the slide. Um, so just going back a little bit to the substance, Mark uh, just a minute ago was talking about the icon um, for the app, probably protected by trademark as well as trade dress. And we think it's also protected by copyright. Um, it looks pretty creative. It looks like artwork. Um, and just like the fabric pattern that we were discussing before that goes around the band of the watch, um, a copyright application could be filed to register that icon. Um, in addition is the app itself. The app is considered a computer program. And as I noted very briefly earlier, computer programs are in fact copyrightable. Um, copyright protection extends to both literal and non-literal elements of a computer program. When I say literal elements, what we're talking about there is source and object code. And when we talk about non-literal elements, really it's what you see. Um, the program's sequence, structure, and organization, as well as the user interface. Now, many times, and particularly true with computer programs, it's very difficult to draw the line between what is copyrightable expression and what is not. And so like I said before, while the underlying code of the program is copyrightable, things like algorithms, methods of operations, and program logic are, are not copyrightable. Um, they are not deemed to be copyrightable expression. And while there is often copyrightable subject matter on screen displays of apps, um, those could be, for example, standalone images, artwork, photos, or text, some of, some of, a little bit of what you see up on the slide. Um, and in addition to standalone images, in some cases, the arrangement of particular elements on the screen might also constitute creative expression and be registrable as a compilation with the Copyright Office. Um, but other than those things, 
generally speaking, it's the position of the Copyright Office that the overall format, layout, design, and arrangement of the screen does not fall within the realm of copy, copyrightable subject matter and is more generally described as uncopyrightable ideas and concepts. Um, but you can register your app and any other type of computer program with the Copyright Office. You can file an application with the Copyright Office and submit to the Copyright Office 20 pages of source code. The Copyright Office also allows the filer to file object code as an alternative. Um, it also allows the filer to block out certain portions of the code that it deems protected by trade secret. But what is very important to keep in mind with registration is that every time a, a separately published version of an app or other type of computer program is published and it contains new and copyrightable authorship, that new published version should be registered with the Copyright Office. It would be registered separately from any prior versions you registered on a new application with payment of a new fee. It's just considered a new copyrightable work. And that registration, as well as any subsequent registrations you would get, would protect only what was newly added to that particular released version. Um, and with respect to registration, one of our listeners today um, asked a question about registration in particular. And it was whether a registration is required for a non-U.S. design, so a copyrightable work that was created outside of the U.S., and whether a registration is required for that non-U.S. work. And a registration, in fact, is not required to claim copyright protection for a non-U.S. work. Um, it's also not required to sue for infringement here in the U.S. However, that owner, without the registration in hand, would not be entitled to the two benefits, two, two benefits I noted earlier, which was the ability to claim attorney's fees if it was a prevailing party here in a U.S. litigation, um, and the ability to claim statutory damages. So with that, I will turn it over to Design Patent. Okay, well, just, I'll just, I'll try to make this brief, but as I uh, mentioned before, uh, increasingly today, people are trying to protect their designs by design patent in virtual reality as much as in reality. We do this by protecting the appearance of something on a screen. It's rather odd and arcane, but uh, this all came about because years ago, people invented new type fonts, and the law developed to allow them to protect those type fonts by protecting the actual lead uh, type blocks that they used to make the fonts in a press. Uh, because the patent laws only apply to articles of manufacture, not to uh, images on a screen. Uh, so what we technically have to do in protecting things by design patent is to claim a portion of a screen um, displaying a certain image. We're actually protecting, in theory, the object itself. Um, but in, in terms of an app, uh, what we find people protecting are uh, various combinations of design features that are visible on the screen at the same time. Uh, it can be an overall layout of a, of a user interface. It can be specific icons. Um, it can be, we'll talk about this in a minute, we can, talk, we can protect animations or transitions between screens. Uh, it's important not to illustrate in solid lines what we call dynamic content in that context. In other words, uh, content that changes you know, with the application uh, because, again, you want the drawings of your design patent application to be generic to all of the instances of that design that you foresee. Um, so uh, again, it's uh, it's it's increasingly being used in in the in the computer science area. Uh, people who uh, find uh, you know the, that their competitors or, or unscrupulous characters are copying their user interface, uh, their website design, um, and using it not only to compete with them but perhaps to do other terrible things on the internet. So, design patent uh, is a way to uh, is a hammer you can use uh, in that context as well. All right, so um, just one more slide on this point. Uh, I mentioned animations. Just to give you an example, if we were to protect um, the animation that might appear on the screen of a cat yawning, for example, if there was some aspect of this app in which the cat goes through a yawning sequence, 
we could protect the appearance of that sequence by filing a design application having, for example, these six views that would go from the smiling face of figure one uh, through a transition to get to the yawn of figure six. Uh, so just to give you an example of how that's done, there's some, uh, uh, quite a number of animation, icon animation uh, design applications being filed uh, these days. So uh, with that, back to Lisa. Thanks, guys. Um, so as you've, as you've seen, there are new and creative elements um, of products can be protected, the apps can be protected, even the source code can be protected by copyright, design patent, and trade dress. And each form of protection provides different advantages and even different lengths of time in protection. We recommend clients think about protecting their intellectual property with multiple forms of IP, which should be filed in parallel to gain the strongest protection. While a utility patent may preclude some considerations for a trade dress filing, it's very common to file utility and design patents relating to the same product and often helpful to file for all forms of IP. So in summary, we think about trade dress protecting the source identifying attributes of a product and proper advertising techniques. When considering copyright protection, we think about a federal registration and ensuring ownership by the company when independent contractors work on projects. And finally, when considering a design patent, we think about protecting the non-functional design elements that will likely carry over across multiple versions. So I wanted to thank everyone for joining us for today's discussion. If you haven't already, and I've seen some come in that we will address in a moment, but please take some time now to send us any questions using the Q&A widget on your screen. Of course, you're welcome to contact any of us personally after we conclude, if you prefer. If others from your organization would benefit from the information provided today, the webinar audio and materials will be posted on Fish and Richardson's website, fr.com, within the next 48 hours. You'll receive a link via email to the presentation recording once it becomes available. If you have any questions regarding CLE credit, please email Ellen at the email address on the screen. And for those in New York, as Kristen noted earlier, please make a note of course code number 604 and include it on the New York CLE form that will be forwarded in a follow-up email. Uh, as a reminder, the code is only for New York attorneys because they have different requirements than other states. Uh, thank you again for joining us today. We appreciate your time. I'm impressed we're, we're concluding exactly on the hour, and we'll now turn to a few questions that came in during the webinar. Um, so first, there was a question that came in about whether the Egyptian goddess test still applies or has been overruled um, or overruled anything with regards to the novelty test. Jim, uh, can, you, can you take that one? Yes, I'd be happy to, um, and, I, and I apologize if my slide was a bit confusing on the points of, in, of infringement. Uh, point of novelty has been a, a, real, uh, a real complicated thing with uh, uh, the Federal Circuit over the years. Um, uh, created a lot of stir in the context of utility patents where the Supreme Court liked to apply that such a test uh, for patentability and, and, uh, and infringement, and, and it got under the, under the burr under the saddle of the, of the Federal Circuit. But bottom line, um, the, the the Federal Circuit finally in 2008, like six years ago, uh, specifically while overruling the point of novelty test for design patents, because they wanted to get rid of it for all patents, frankly, um, they at the same time modified the the other test, and I didn't want to get into all this detail, but this is it's a good, I'm glad someone raised the question, modify the ordinary observer test, which had been around since 1871 from Gorham v. White, uh, to, to essentially add a, a, uh, add a novelty aspect to that test, to basically say the comparison between the two designs uh, to establish infringement, see that ordinary observer test has to be done uh, in light of the prior art. Uh, in other words, you do have to consider the novelty of the design in even determining the infringement. So those two aspects are still there. They're just um, – so, yes, I'll, I'm gonna, in fact, I'm going to modify that slide before I send out the materials just to not confuse anyone. Um, but but the, 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 the point I wanted to make in that slide is that uh, design infringement, even though it's a patent case, uh, still has a flavor of trademark because it's in the eyes of an ordinary observer being induced to purchase one product thinking it's the other. And that's the, that's the main point. 
you, Jim. Um, another question came in about whether you'd file anything to protect trade dress or just establish it by creation and publication. And um, of course, there's probably a, a, an important timing consideration on the filing and secondary meeting. But Mark, can you address that one? Sure. So um, uh, the the difficult thing is that uh, the examining attorney at the PTO is going to certainly inquire about secondary meaning. So you, you, you want to make your application at a point in, in the life cycle of the product when you're confident that you're going to be able to demonstrate secondary meaning um, so that it will uh, overcome that hurdle. So um, it, it's it's kind of an it's de it depends answer. You know, you, you want to do it as soon as you can so that you can begin to establish uh, the record that trade dress is a, an important uh, element of your overall IP scheme, um, but you don't want to do it prematurely because then you may not be able to uh, offer sufficient evidence uh, it, it, when, the, when or if the question comes from the examining attorney. So it, it necessarily depends on... Um, a judgment on the types and quantity of evidence that you think you can marshal at the time of your application. Uh, thank you. I think there are two questions, hopefully, Jim, you can help us with. One is, what sort of clearance searches do you recommend before filing design patent applications? And another one relates to if you can confirm that the U.S. now gives a 15-year life to design patents. Or when does that start under the treaty? Yes. Um, on, on the first point, I, I think I think that the person who asked the question may have been referring not to clearance searches, which are normally done to see if a new product that you plan to launch won't infringe anyone else's patent. To uh, rather than I think they're speaking of novel, what we call novelty searches to see if a new design is is really sufficiently new and non-obvious before going to the bother of filing a design patent application. As to that, I can say that frankly as a practical matter it's almost never done. Um, the uh, Typically it, the uh, inventor or the designer's uh, own knowledge of the things that have gone before is, is considered. Um, uh, the, the preparation of design patent applications is, is so much less expensive than utility patent applications and it's so difficult to do a search. In fact, the, the examiners themselves a search by by class and subclass, um, just a visually um, what they used to call a shoe search, uh, because there's no it's, it's impossible to do a a word search to find prior art uh, for a particular design. So, bottom, bottom line, almost never done. Uh, the second question had to do with the change of term. This was <clears throat> something that came about with the U.S. Um, implementing the Patent Law Treaty and the Hague Convention that uh, took place late last year. I believe it was October. Uh, sometime, but any application filed after that date, uh, technically the uh, the term is to be 15 years from uh, grant. It's it's a harmonization point to make uh, to harmonize the U.S. law with with other countries. It used to be 14 years. Thank you. Um, well, I think with that and without extending too far into uh, depending on where you are in the country, folks, lunch hour or whatever. I, we all wanted to thank you on behalf of all of us at FISH and my colleagues here who present today. Um, we appreciate your time and feel free to reach out to any of us with any further questions. Thank you very much.